It's spooky season. Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Murders, Mysteries, and More. My name is Kaylee. And my name is Desi. Be sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell next to the subscribe button to turn on post notifications. Before we get into this case, we always encourage those who have useful information to any unsolved case, please report it to your local police and sheriff department. Today we will be unlocking the Kenny murders in Cabin 28. It's 1979. Glenna Sue Shark finally was able to escape her abusive husband in Connecticut and head to the Golden State of California, specifically Quincy, California. She had five kids and they all supposedly lived in a trailer owned by Sharp's brother. September 1980, the family moved into a bigger, better place in the town of Ketty, formerly a resort town. This town was originally all about that hustle and bustle. However, at this time, it was dead. Nobody really lived there. Sharp's neighbors described Sue as introverted and that she only had one friend. Sue attended business college at Feather River City Community College. The college describes her as a bright student with excellent grades and she had a clean criminal record. Sue was known to be dating a man named Darrow one week before April 11, 1981. The day before the murder, Sheila, Sue's daughter, stayed with the Seabolts in Cabin 27 and had a sleepover with her friend Alyssa. The next morning at 7 a.m. So the next morning around 7 a.m. she woke up and left cabin 27 to go get her church clothes from home. When she walked in she discovered the gruesome scene of Sue, her brother John, and Dan Wingate, which was John's friends, dead on the floor. Of course after that she called the authorities. And then for the investigation, so basically John and Sue were noted to have blunt force trauma and they had multiple stab wounds. And then Dan had trauma to his head, but clearly his cause of death was from strangulations. Weapons were also found at the crime scene. The weapons that they found were knives, a hammer, they were all covered in blood. What's very interesting is one of the knives was actually a steak knife that had came from the cabin's kitchen. They also did happen to find medical tape which was used to tie the victims and there was a little bit of DNA evidence on that medical tape found. However, it was not disclosed to if the DNA that they found was matched to anyone. Police had an interview with the next door neighbors and around 1 to 2 o'clock a.m. they heard what sounded like heavy groaning or maybe muffled screams. But other than that, nothing seemed amiss after they went outside to investigate, so they went back to bed. Justin, the neighbor's kid, had dreams after murders of two men in the front room holding a knife and a hammer. He also says in the dream he saw Sue talking to the men and also that in the dream Sue was stabbed. He also saw a tall man with blonde hair and a mustache and a short man who was clean shaven with dark hair in the street. That's really interesting how he happened to dream all of that. Now for the Marty Smart confession, so Marilyn, the neighbor, says that Marty gave her a letter confessing to the murders. And specifically in his confession, he says this quote unquote, I paid the price of your love and now I bought it with four people's lives. And now Obviously, during this, three bodies were found, and then Tina's remains were not found until later, which we'll go into that. So that's interesting how he says that. Despite these confessions and police kind of looking into investigation, nothing was done. So he was not um, arrested. And then his neighbor, Bo live with Marty and his wife and according to Bo, Bo said that Marty was out during the night of the murders. So that is definitely something important to note. Also, Marty only lives two cabins away from the cabins that Sue lives at. So that's a little bit weird. 
a little bit weird. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so theory one is, of course, Marty Smart, which is the neighbor's damn foe. Of course, like you have said earlier, Marty had a confession letter. But a little bit of back, kind of like background to Marty, he was a Vietnam veteran with PTSD known to have some deep-seated anger issues. He was Justin's stepdad, and in particular, he had a hatred for John Smart, uh, Sharp, which was Sue's 15-year-old son. Marty was abusive. Justin, who was a very bright kid, had vivid dreams of these murders. Of course, Marty was brought in for questioning for an interview with law enforcement and how he would begin to express a behavior that now police recognize was kind of troubling. Um, his excuse was that he was at a local bar with his wife and his friend, Bo, and that he was the one who had seen two suspicious looking men who uh, ironically bore a resemblance to him and his friend John. So also in that same interview, he also said he lost a hammer short time prior to that. Very suspicious, but... That is yeah. suspicious, and then they did end up finding that hammer later on, too. Shortly after that, law enforcement did let Marty go, and Marty left for Reno shortly after that. Uh, police claim they think it's more than one person, and obviously nobody was arrested. So, my question to you is, who do you think stole, like, the hammer, exactly? Or was it just a, you know coincidental cover-up of the fact that these people were murdered with hammers and it could have been Marty's. Yeah, I, th I can see it two ways. One of two ways. First of all, I can definitely see that Marty could have been involved somehow because, for one, Marty has the anger issues like we've said and you also said that he suffered from PTSD and not to throw shade at anybody with PTSD and then the fact that he was just very like abusive towards um justin which was his stepchild um is definitely suspicious and he was potentially abusive to his own wife so i wouldn't exactly put it past him and it was interesting how la later on they did end up finding his hammer um so i definitely think it could have been him it could have also been possibly his roommate that had taken it because also like Bo was also kind of suspicious too as well it could have actually even been both of them together and the fact that Bo was already living with them anyways would make it really easy for him to get a hold of this hammer and commit these horrible crimes so uh, my question is it's there's some piece of information here Marty and Bo left and went back to that bar in uh, different outfits shortly around like 11 o'clock. Do you think this could have been a possible attempt to give them an alibi for these murders? That is very possible. It is super weird that they ended up leaving at 11 because later on you're gonna find out like in at 10 o'clock both John and his friend Dana were both at a party at 10 o'clock so that is like very close to that time frame like that's a one hour difference so it definitely is a little bit suspicious that they went to the bar to do that and it would make sense that they would have ended up going there to get an alibi because since both John and Dana were still out at a party during that time then if they're saying that they're out at a bar at 11 then basically it seems like they couldn't have been a part of it sue was apparently trying to convince Marty to leave his wife marilyn could this have been a motive as to why marty and Bo killed her and her two kids that definitely could have been a possibility. Okay, so first of all, with knowing the background of Marty and him being puzzling abusive and suffering from PTSD, if someone had told him to leave his wife, so if Sue had told him, that definitely would have probably triggered his PTSD and have just made the situation worse. 
which end result, like, if she was try trying to convince him to leave her because he she knew about the abuse he was doing to his wife, obviously abusers, they're going to do everything that they can do to be in control of the situation. And the fact that Sue is constantly pushing for her to get away from this abusive man because she herself left for California because of her husband being abusive and she wanted to be there for, yeah, for Marilyn. That would have totally just made the situation worse and obviously he had two choices, either to just let her leave him, but then his wife could have went after his money or something, or instead he could have taken Sue out, so then there would be no witness or anyone brave enough to say that Marty was doing all these horrible things to his wife, which then he would be able to still be in control of their marriage. There is a second theory that is floating around that a hitchhiker who picked up the two teenagers, Dana and John, John was Sue's child, um, and they both were victims that died, that this hitchhiker could have basically taken advantage and killed them. So on April 11th, 1981, at around 10 p.m., supposedly some witnesses say that both teenagers were seen in the town of Quincy that they were supposedly hitchhiking, like they needed a ride back home. Also, whenever the police went to do the investig- like, um, check out the crime scene, they did find a bloody fingerprint on one of the doors, and they did some DNA testing, however, they never found out who this DNA belonged to. you think if they found out if that DNA belonged to Marty, then it would have been him. Um, never were able to figure that out or match it to anyone. And then some witnesses, friends that were at the party with both Dana and John, they decided not to come forward and really talk about the police when they were asking questions. The main reason why they kind of avoided to go forward is because that there potentially could be drugs and alcohol involved and so if they would have said some information even though it would have helped them solve the case they might have gotten in, in trouble because they were underage drinking and stuff like that and maybe there was someone who's 18 years or older supplying them with the drugs and alcohol and they did not want them to get in trouble so obviously, easily someone from the party could have easily taken advantage of them, saw that they may have ride home, just taken them home, and then basically mm -hmm. killed them. Or even someone in the streets could have seen them shone by, and then like you've seen in all the horror movies with the hitchhiker, they've decided to kill. So my first question to you is, about the witnesses, so why do you think the witnesses choose to not talk about what they know about Dana and John at the party? Maybe because the they were doing illegal things or things that they weren't supposed to being underage uh, teenagers, of course. Or the fact that the witnesses maybe just didn't want to get involved in the case at all. That's true. And with that being said, do you think drugs and alcohol could have been involved and thus is like someone from the party have been involved in the murder. I mean it's very possible they could have found somebody at the party that they knew and they could have been under the influence and this person could have despised them so they could have very easily taken advantage of them deciding you know hey I'm gonna give these people a ride home and then thus proceeded to murder the two boys and John's mom. Yeah, and then also someone else later on murdered Tina, too. Yeah, that could have been just coincidental as well as murdering John and Dana and Sue. The, you know, Tina could have came downstairs um, and heard a commotion and she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and got murdered. That would have sucked. My next question is, do you think that a hitchhiker 
could have seen that they needed a ride home and just took an advantage and this played out like those, you know, horror movies with the hitchhikers. <laughs> Very possible because you never know who you're getting into a car with. It could be a serial killer, it could be pedophile, it could be anything. That's why people really recommend you don't take rides from hitchhikers at all because you definitely don't know that person, period. Of a couple more guys. So why do you think that whoever killed them left two of the kids alone? Like they were sound asleep and didn't kill them, but killed the mom and these all these other people. Because it could have been just their objective to murder the four and left the two, or the two were sleeping and hadn't witnessed anything and hadn't heard anything so they were completely innocent and um, they just decided not to harm them and it's super weird about how you mentioned the four because like we've talked about that confession letter of marty smart basically he makes that confession about buying four people's lives it could have been like a a ritual thing as well, like some people do when they're in cults, or since Marty actually suffered from PTSD, it could have he could have had voices inside of his head telling him to murder them. Right. Maybe he had some sort of weird thing about the number four. <laughs> so on April twenty second, nineteen eighty four, Tina, which was the twelve year old girl that was murdered, her skull was missing for a while and it was away from the rest of the bodies. A bystander named Ronald Padrini found a skull, and then an anonymous person called the police saying the skull probably belonged to a preteen. Uh, that's when the police began to investigate and police found out that the skull linked to Tina. Why do you think that her skull was so far away from the rest of the bodies? I think that the reason why her skull might have been left far away from the bodies is maybe there was more than one killer. Hitchhiker um, could have been for the two teenagers and then the mom could have discovered that and maybe there was another person like involved in the killing and maybe Tina decided she heard something and she wasn't supposed to see it and she immediately ran away and they were trying to kill Sue in the process and unfortunately with younger kids them running out in like the woods or whatever is not very safe and so someone could have seen her from outside and decide to kill her or if there was two people involved in this one of the people could have like gone gone after her and that might be why her body's found so far away because she tried to run away from the killer. Also there's one thing I want to interject here. Most of the time when people do kill, whether they're severe killers or not, sometimes they have valuables that they like to keep from the scene of the crime that they can easily uh, go back to to kind of relive that scene. Why do you think an anonymous person called I'm saying the school probably belonged to a preteen. Could this have been Ronald Pedrini, who was the bystander that found it? Yeah, it is possible that, you know, he could have actually been involved too. Because, again, like, for one, nobody would have really expected him because he was this bystander who found the school and actually helped them find where Tina was, which is helping solve this case to an extent. And so, um, he definitely, he definitely could have just decided to anonymously call. He found this call and was like, oh shit, maybe I should tell the police about this. For some reason, like maybe, you know, a few years later, he kind of felt bad for these murders, but was like, I don't really want to go to jail, so I'm just going to call the police so that they don't think that I did it, even though I did it. So he could have definitely said that. He could have also been a scientist that we don't know, and so maybe he actually has seen schools before and bodies before and examined them, wanted to help the police out a lot. And so, but at the same time, he didn't want to seem suspicious, so maybe he anonymously called after he told the police he found him and saying that 
they should look into it being a preteen because for a while police thought that skull belonged to an indigenous regular adult person but they come to find out it actually belongs to Sue's one of her children Tina who do we think did it so I personally have a couple theories but the one that tends to stick a lot to me is Marty Smart. It definitely is super weird about his confession letter when he says, I paid the price of your love, now I bought it with four people's lives. So basically, him like giving that to his wife is just really weird. Basically, this was him, the price of him saying that he's killing them because he knows that she is going to leave them and he wants to show that he has control of her and that she cannot escape this abusive situation. So I definitely think that it is very possible that he was involved. Also, like he only lived two cabins away from Sue, so he would have definitely known where she slept and how her schedule was. So it would have made it so much easier for him to actually kill them. Also, like I said, he could have gotten even the roommate Bo involved because basically he needed help to kill more people, like kill like four people to make like a statement basically. And so it is kind of difficult for one person to just straight up take on four people at once. So having an accomplice makes things go a little bit smoother and you're able to hide stuff. Apparently to the neighbors say, oh, one to two a.m. they heard screams, but they just went back to bed. I think like if I heard screams, I definitely would probably report it to someone and they just did not report it to anybody so that's super suspicious but i also part of me does think that it could be something totally different that there could have been a hitchhiker out there as there are people that have done that before they will take advantage of people who are hitchhiking and they didn't realize like there was other people there where they were going to kill them and so then they decided to kill Sue because she was arguing and then at this time supposedly Marty and his wife were out and then Justin and a couple of the other kids were sleeping so obviously whoever witnessed these murders this killer was obviously going to kill the police have not link the DNA to anyone specifically like for the bloody fingerprint and I feel like if it was just Marty wouldn't they have already been able to match that up to him? I think it was Marty and Bo just because Marty thought that Sue probably ruined his marriage after she told Marilyn to leave town so he held this huge grudge against her and John, Dana, and Tina were just unfortunately at the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. He probably killed them because they were awake and didn't want any witnesses. And probably with, like, his wife, she's probably asleep. Justin was probably asleep. And then those other two kids were asleep. And then Tina probably, she came out, heard something, and he decided to kill her because he didn't want any witnesses. To this day, it remains a great mystery as far as who committed these heinous crimes in Caddy Cabin 28. We hope one day this case will be unlocked. Thank you for listening to another episode of Murders, Mysteries, and more.